So far, we've uh, taken a look at probability and counting rules and how they work. Before that, we were taking a look at our descriptive statistics, our mean, our median, our standard deviations, and our variances. And yet, even before that, we were taking a look at our different types of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio, and our different types of variables, whether they be discrete, continuous, and what we're going to get at today is we're going to start to bring all of this together. What we're taking a look at today is a discrete probability distribution. So, okay, discrete, we're dealing with a discrete variable. Probability, that's popping in, right? That's just from our last chapter. We're going to be having that carry forward with us. And then distribution is going to be the way that it's distributed along. So a lot of our descriptive statistics are going to become relevant in that. The mean, the variance, where we're located, and the dispersion of that location amongst the number line. We'll be creating some histograms, some bar charts based off of our distributions as well, so we can actually visualize what's happening. Uh, what we're going to be doing to start off is we're going to be taking a look at some generic distributions for discrete random variables. And right, one of the first things we're going to have to do is kind of define that. What is a discrete random variable? Once we get through this kind of general case, that will be this first video. We'll take a look at that. Uh, the second video, discrete probability distributions two, we'll be moving on to take a look at two specific distributions. Uh, these will be known as the binomial distribution and the Poisson distribution. So for today, for this video, let's uh, carry on and take a look at our first one. Just a initial introduction, defining our terms, and then what this generic distribution looks like. Okay, so what we're going to start off with then is our definition, and that is what exactly do we mean by a discrete random variable? So there we go, discrete random variable. Let's start off with this whole bit here about what we mean by a random variable. So our V, a random variable. Well, what a random variable is, is it represents, well, it's going to represent the outcomes of a trial or an experiment, right? Keep in mind, we said, hey, we run a trial, we run an experiment, we're going to have these random outcomes. Well, those outcomes, that is our random variable of interest. So far, right, typically we've called this a random variable of X. We flip a coin. Well, our random variable was either we get heads or we get tails, right? And then we could say, hey, we flip a coin, X was heads or we flip a coin and x was tails, depending on what the result was. So that's our first bit. Random variable, the result of our trial or our experiment. Next bit is, okay, what do we mean by discrete? So, okay, hopefully we recall discrete from our first little bits of readings. Really what a discrete random variable is, is it's an outcome that has gaps between the values. So, right, generically when we think about this, we think about it as like, rolling a dice. We could get one, two, three, four, five, or six, right? In this case, we have whole numbers. There's this discrete kind of counting, and we have these gaps, right? You could not roll a dice and get 1.5 or 1.25 or something like that. It's just whole numbers in this case here. Another discrete random variable could be like we just looked at, flipping a coin and getting heads or tails. In this case, two discrete outcomes. There's no continuity. There's no kind of uh, continuum between the two. Now, a big thing is that discrete random variables don't actually have to be whole numbers. We could actually have a discrete random variable that was 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, on, on, on. Right, As long as we had these gaps between, that is, we could not have a continuum such that we could pull out a 0 0.1126 or something like that, as long as we were bounded to jumping up in increments in this constant interval of plus 0.1, of plus 0.1, right? as long as we had this constant interval in between such that we couldn't pull out numbers in between, this would also be discrete. So, okay, big thing with our discrete random variables are just going to be situations where we're stuck counting, right? And that's going to be the big things. Things that are discrete are going to be counted. Things which are continuous are typically measured. So we'll get to continuous random variables in the following chapters. But for this one here, discrete random variables, discrete is typically the result of 
a count. Right? We've counted 1, 2, 3. We've counted 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So this is going to be kind of our good way. As we move on in the course and we have both continuous and discrete variables at the same time, it's going to be a good way for us to be able to differentiate one from another. Okay, from here then, let's go and take a look at what we can do with these discrete random variables. Uh, what we're going to be doing is taking a look at creating a discrete probability distribution. And to do that, let's just start off with an easy, simple example. And well, maybe it's not so easy, maybe it's not so simple, but at least I ideologically it's simple. What we're going to presume is that we are going to flip a coin four times. Right, so we're going to flip a coin four times and we want to know, hey, what is the likelihood, what is the probability that in these four flips that I get three heads, right? So what's the probability of witnessing three heads in four coin tosses? Well, okay, kind of something we can back up and kind of relay this back to our previous chapter. First thing we can kind of ask, what kind of probability are we utilizing here? Is this um, empirical probability? Is this classical probability? Which one, which one would be utilizing in order to solve this? Give you a second to kind of think about that there. Hopefully you came back and you realized, okay, this was a, an example of classical probabilities, right? We know the outcomes. We can work through all of the outcomes. They're collectively exhaustive. Probability of all of the outcomes were identical. And we didn't have to run experiments. We could just go and work through this without the experiment and work out our probability. So classical probability is what we're going to be utilizing. In order to get classical probability, well, we need to work out our number of, what do we say, favorable outcomes. So how many favorable outcomes occur versus how many total outcomes are there? All right, and so this is the big thing. We need to have a list, a collectively exhaustive list of all of our outcomes, all of our possible outcomes. And then we'll just go through that list and we're going to count how many of them are favorable. That is how many of them have three heads versus how many possible outcomes we have all together. So in order to do this, we need to figure out, right? We could just start playing and saying, okay, well, I can get heads, 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 heads tails, and going through that. But what's your check, right? What's your check to make sure that you actually have all of the outcomes that are possible? What's to, you know, be that, oh no, I missed one. How would you know? How would you know you missed a possible outcome? So we need our counting rules to kind of make sure that we get all of the outcomes that we need. And in this case, I'd use my rules of arrangement, right? Such that my total number of outcomes, well, what am I going to have? I'm going to have four flips. So flip a coin four times. How many outcomes do I have for the first flip? Two. How many outcomes for the second flip? Well, two. Two and two. All right, so we have two to the power of four, two times two times two times two. That's going to give us 16 possible outcomes altogether. So, okay, from here we have to go through that long process of actually identifying what all those outcomes are. But mind you, right, this is a bit better because now we know we need 16 unique outcomes. So, yeah, 16. Not so bad. We can kind of keep track of that and make sure we don't lose any and finish off at 15 and be, oh, yeah, we got them all. I can't think of any others. So, okay, what are they going to be? Let's, let's just go through it. We could have heads, 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 heads. From here, right, we could go through it and we could just start throwing in tails, heads, 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 tails. We could work that tails through it. Heads, tails, heads, heads. Okay, keep going on. We could go tails, heads, heads, heads. Right, and this is just the monotonous part of this. We just got to keep going through. We got to work out all of our possible outcomes. Uh, what else could I have? I could have heads, tails, tails, heads. Um, we could be looking at two heads followed by two tails. Or we could be having... Tails, heads, heads, tails. What else could we have? Um, uh, we could have 
tails, heads, tails, heads, or heads, tails, heads, tails. Um, and then I think that's all for the two tails, two heads. Let's jump into, we could have three tails and a head. We could then have tails, tails, heads, tail. Tails, 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 head, tails, tails. And then head, triple, tail. And then I think that does us, that should be all 16. Four by four is what we just created. We have 16 here all together. Right, okay, that was boring, that was a pain, but sometimes this is what we have to do, right? If we want to use our classical probabilities, we have to identify all of our outcomes. So, okay, what are we looking at now? We want to know, hey, what's the probability of witnessing three heads and four flips? So all we have to do is just go through and find out, okay, how many times do we have three heads occur? Well, there's one, there's two, there's three. Okay, so three times. Do I have any other times where I have three heads? Oh, right here. One more. And then two heads. Two, 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 two. One, one, one. Okay, so all together, probability of three heads is going to be four favorable outcomes all over 16 all together. Well, uh, what's that? Four favorable outcomes over 16 all together. That's going to be 0.25, 25% likelihood of getting three heads in four coin tosses. Okay, here's the thing. Cool. We answered this one question. What we can do since we have all of our outcomes listed is we can actually go and create a little frequency table so that we can identify all of our possible outcomes and the probability of all of them that are attached. And this is how we're ultimately going to be building a frequency table and a probability distribution. So, okay, I said this is how we ultimately build a frequency table. That's what we're doing. This is how we ultimately build a probability distribution. And that's what we're going to be doing here. So let's just back up a little bit here. Okay, so we have all of our outcomes still listed here. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to put this into a table. So let's just scooch over just a little bit so we can still see it, but so that we have room to play with a table. And let's go and create this frequency table. So first we're going to have our, what are we interested in? We're really interested in the number of heads. So this is our random variable, and that there is number of heads, Right, and this is our x. This is our discrete random variable. How many heads we get. So what are our possible outcomes here? What could we be witnessing? Let's uh, kind of try to keep this relatively in line here. So let's make some little uh, lines underneath so we can kind of keep this looking somewhat ordered. We could witness zero heads, right, and four coin tosses. We could have no heads. We could have one. We could have two. We could have three, or finally, we could have four. So, okay, we have all of our possibilities. Let's just drag that last guy through there. Ah, oh, might as well make it look nice. Okay, so we have all that. What we would then have is we would have our frequency of x, which is how often each of these occurs. So, okay, we can work this through. How often do we get zero heads? Well, that's this guy here, where we had all tails. So we had that once. How many times do we get one heads? Well, that's one, two, three, and four, and now I'm into twos. So, okay, four times I get one heads. How many times do I get two? Well, that's two, one, two, three, four, five and six. So in six of these cases, I had two heads. Carrying on, how many times do I get three heads? Well, there's three, one, two, three, and four. And then I only have one of these guys left. How many times do I get one heads? Or sorry, how many times do I get four heads? I get that once. Now what we can do, right, we can sum this. One and four is five, one and four is five. Okay, five and five is 10, 10 and six is 16. This should have been the number we were expecting because we had 16 outcomes all together. And so 
summation of our frequencies should be one and the same as our total number of outcomes. So good, good. We're, we're happy with that, right? Things are going the way we want it to. But hey, we're looking at a probability distribution, not just a frequency distribution. So what we're also going to be interested in is, hey, what is my probability of X occurring? All right? That is, what's the probability of witnessing zero? What's the probability of witnessing one, two, three, four, and on and on and on? And well, okay, how do we find this? Well, keep in mind, probability is just going to be, hey, how many favorable outcomes we have versus how many total outcomes we have. So, okay, zero heads, that occurred once. So one out of 16, what is that? One out of 16, 0 0.0625, we'll carry that around to a few decimal places, why not? Ah, four times, well we worked this one out, four times out of 16, four to 16, that's 0 0.25, 25%. Six out of 16, it's going to be 37. Whoa, that was not nice looking. 37. 37.5%. And then, okay, we're back to four. So that's going to be 25%. And then we're back to one. That's going to be again 6.25%. Just as our frequencies sum to 16, our probabilities in this sense here should sum to one. And lo and behold, what do we get? Probability of witnessing three heads is 25%, just as we had worked it out independently there. So we get all of our possible probabilities that could occur. All right, in this case here, what we can do, once we have this table, once we have it all fully worked out, this actually helps us quite a bit because we can work out some other kind of maybe odd probabilities. That is, what if I want to know, hey, what's the probability that in four coin tosses, I witness three or four heads, right? So, hey, this is now our addition rule that we looked at in our previous bit. So, hey, what's the likelihood that I get three heads or four heads? Well, that's going to be probability of three plus probability of four. Right? This is going to be my special edition rule because these are mutually exclusive events. I could not witness three heads and four heads in the same trial. So, okay, it's either I'm going to get three out of four or four out of four heads. And what's that going to work out to? That's going to be 25% plus 6.25%. So altogether, my probability of witnessing three or or that's going to be what? 25, that's going to be 0.3125, so 31.25%, 0.3125. Likelihood that I witness this event or that event. What we can also do then is put this into a graph, right? We can create a histogram representing that. So let's go take a look at that next. So let's take a look at how we're going to build this bar chart. I think in the past I did just say histogram. Um, just to clarify that, these would be a bar chart. Yes, we have the numeric, but given that this is discrete data, we don't have this continuation of 0 into 1, of 1 into 2, and on and on and on. We have these discrete variables. There is the jump. There is the gap from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, on and on and on. So thus we'd be using a bar chart, not necessarily a histogram. So let's take a look at how exactly we would work that through. And I mean, really shouldn't be much of a surprise to us. It's gonna be just like how we've typically done it. Big difference is because we're looking at the probability distribution, what we're gonna want for our vertical axes is we're gonna be looking at the probability of X. Our horizontal axis then, this is X, so in this case here, number of heads. And well, we're just gonna have zero. Try to keep right roughly a good, right? If we're freehanding it the best we can, if we're using computer, well, the computer does the scale just fine for us. Uh, where am I going? And one more. So zero, one, two, three, four. 
Okay, keeping in mind what we're looking to graph with this bar chart is our probability of X, so this outside, this far right column. So take a look at where our max value is going to be. And we are topping out at 0.375, so let's set this guy here up at 0 0.4. So if that guy there is 0 0.4, well, I can cut this uh, roughly in half, something like that. There's going to be my 0.2. 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and then cut in half again. I have 0 0.5, 0 0.15, 0 0.25, and 0 0.35. So rough scale going up. It's not perfect, but it's not bad either. What I can now do is draw my bar chart where the height of each bar is representing my probability. So the probability that I get zero heads is going to be 0.625. So it's just over the five there. Let's try to make this a straight line. There we go. Carrying on probability I get one head is 25%. So we'll jump all the way up there to 25%. Two heads, that guy there is our 0.375%, so right about up to our top. And back down. And then we're just repeating. So three is back to 25, that looks about right. And four, four is back to 6.75. So there we go. We have our histogram, sorry, we have our bar chart of our discrete probability distribution and in this sense here the height of each bar height of each bar here represents the corresponding probability of the event happening right that is if you want to think about this if you want to think about these bars as little uh, densities well what do we have we have base of one height of 0 0.25 so the probability of this event occurring one heads is going to be the area of this guy here base time site 25 percent if we want to know hey what was the probability of having two or more heads well 0 0.375 0 0.25 0 0.0625 we would get this guy plus that guy plus that guy and that would give us the probability of witnessing two or more two three or four right so we could add up all of those probabilities and compute it as such so we've just seen generic kind of probability distribution we had to work out for this classical situation what all of our outcomes were from all these outcomes we could build a frequency table from this frequency table we could then go and build a bar chart showing the probability of each event occurring what we could now do as well, just right to kind of bring this all the way back around to our descriptive statistics, is we could say, hey, here's some distribution located on the number line. Where is this distribution centered? That is, if I were to continually flip four coins, on average, how many heads do I expect to witness? And then, hey, if I were to keep doing this again and again, what is going to be my dispersion, right? So, okay, I'm going to get some average result, but plus how much, minus some, how much? Where am I likely to fall? And we can kind of see how that's gonna fall by looking at the diagram, but we wanna compute as well, what is gonna be our mean, and what is gonna be our standard deviation of our number of heads, right? And again, this is our X, this is number of heads is what we were actually displaying. So how are we going to figure out this mean and this standard deviation? Well, let's take a look at that next. The mean, well, this guy here, this is often also referred to as our expected value. So the mean of X or the expected value of X, which you will sometimes see as the expected value of X. And that's just saying, you know, like we said, if we kept doing this, what value would we expect to kind of witness the most? And so to work out our expected value, our mean of x, let's, um, let's actually start on a new page here and we'll come back to this one. 
So for our mean of x on the new page, what we're looking for, mean of x, or like we said, we can also call this the expected value of x. The way that we're gonna solve this, and I'm just gonna use this mean notation, so mu of x is gonna be equal to the summation of our values of x, so xi, times the probability of that event occurring. So that is, we wanna take a look at it. We would say, okay, here's x, observation one, two, three, four, and five, right? This would be my i if you wanted to think of it in that way. One, observation one, so okay, x is zero, probability is 0.625. I can work out, I can work out x times the probability of x, so zero times 0.0625, well, okay, that's not too bad, that's zero. Carrying on, what am I gonna get? One times point, oh, right, I can do that again in my head. Two times 0.375, well, that's gonna be point. 0.75, three times 0.25, that's gonna be 0.75 again, and four times 0.0625, that will be 0.25. In this sense here, I can take the summation, right? Summation of xpx, so here's my xpx, I wanna take the summation of it. What do I get? 0.25 and 0.75 is one. That's one, so altogether this is gonna to sum to two. Right, keep in mind what is this telling me? This is, right, these here, these are not probabilities that I worked out. This is not a probability. Probability is bounded between zero and one. What this here is, is my average number of heads that I would expect to see if I kept flipping a coin four times and then recording. Flipping a coin four times and recording. Right? That's what I would expect to witness on average. So that's my average result. And if we go back and take a look at our distribution, well, okay, that kind of makes sense, right? We shouldn't be too surprised that we have a mean right there at two. Given our kind of characteristics of the arithmetic mean, one of them is that it's the balancing point of the data. Given that this is a fairly symmetric distribution, yeah, we would expect the mean to be right in the middle. Half the data is balanced on one side, half on the other. So, okay, not too surprising. That, that there, that would be our value of our mean, right at two. What about our variance? What about our standard deviation? How are we gonna calculate that guy? Well, we can calculate that guy. Let's uh, just scroll down just a touch so I can write down how we would get it. Our variance, so variance is sigma squared. Our variance is going to be equal to, well, okay, a little bit different for this guy, but not that much different from what we've been looking at. Our variance is, let me get the right one there, summation of, xi minus our mean of x squared, right? So same kind of basic idea for our variance, summation of squared deviations. But in this case, instead of going divided by n, we're gonna take all this and we're gonna times it by the probability of xi. So let's work through this, um, let's work through this formula then. Let's see how exactly we'd work out this variance. And to do so, right, let's just, Go right back up here and we'll work through it based off of our table, just carrying on with a new column. So what do we want next? Let's create our new column and we're gonna be taking a look at our squared deviations from mean. So X minus my mean squared. And right, we could carry these bars on just to give us some um, Consistency here so that we can follow along a bit easier without kind of drifting up or down. Okay, so working through this then, what do we get for our first guy? X minus the mean squared. So what do we have for our value of X? Zero minus two squared, well, that's not too bad. That's gonna be four. My next one, 
x of 1 minus the mean, so 1 minus 2 is negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1, 2 minus 2 squared, 0, 3 minus 2, that's 1, 1 squared is 1, and then 4 minus 2, that's 2 again, 2 squared is, uh, sorry, 2 squared is 4, there we go. And now keep in mind what we're doing is we're doing the summation of squared deviations of mean times the probability of x. So we don't want to sum things yet. No summation. Do not do it there. What we now need is x minus the mu squared times our probability of x. So what's that going to be? 4 times 0 0.0625. So 4 times 0 0.0625, that's going to be... 0.25, 1 times 0.25, I can do that, 0.25, 0 times, yeah, that's 0, 1 times 0.25, that's going to be another 0.25, and then 4 times 0.65, well, another 0.25, well, that's easy to add, that's going to be 1, right, keeping in mind, this is my variance, so that there is technically 1 heads Squared is my variance, being like, okay, I would expect if I were to keep doing this, if I were to flip a coin four times, my typical expectation would be that I get two heads, then with one or plus or minus one head squared. What? Yeah, right, variance doesn't really always make a lot of sense in terms of units. And that's why we move from the variance to our standard deviation of x, which again is just the square root of our variance. So okay, in this case here, square root of our variance, square root of 1 is 1. So we get a standard deviation of x of 1, being that okay, typically if we kept flipping a coin, flipping a coin, did it four times, recorded the outcome, on average we would be expecting to get two heads, and then typical deviation from that would be plus or minus one head. So maybe as low as 1, maybe as high as 3. Let's go and look at our graph again. Does that make sense? Well, okay. So we expected to get two heads on average. Then we're saying that that could fall as low as one, as high as three. All right, this guy here, this is our plus or minus one standard deviation. So that would be minus one standard deviation plus one standard deviation. And we see that, yeah, okay, most of our data kind of falls within that area. Yeah, we're kind of seeing what's happening, how things are falling through, and it kind of is making sense. So for our generic kind of probability distribution, we can work through it in this kind of way. So, okay, what were our steps here? What were our steps? Let's go think about those. Our steps in kind of attacking this generic discrete probability distribution. First thing we had to do is we had to come up with a collectively exhaustive list of outcomes. Sometimes what that means is using our counting rules in order to make sure that we get them all. Right? This is just a good kind of check to say, hey, when I'm working through all my outcomes that I kind of think could occur, am I getting to this number? So, okay. First, we want to list all outcomes. Great. We've done that. Next thing we want to do is we want to build a frequency table. So okay, in this case, I decided to build my frequency table based off of the number of heads. And I did it at 0 through 4. I could have built this frequency table based off of the number of tails, right? And it could have been 0 through 4 tails. It would have worked out exactly the same. This was perfectly symmetric, but it was just choice, right? So second thing I want to do is build my frequency table based off of the events that are interesting, zero to four heads. Once I have my frequency table, including the relative frequency, well, I could then go and create my bar chart. I could then go and create my bar chart and kind of visualize what's happening and take a look at what this probability distribution actually looks like. Um, probably jumped ahead too far there. I could attach into this bit here. It is in this step, in step two, that I could calculate my descriptive statistics. 
descriptive stats. That is, I could calculate my mean, I could calculate my standard deviation from the frequency table as we had done in that last example. So that does us for our kind of generic discrete um, distribution. What we're going to take a look at next is kind of an example of all this. Um, I'm going to leave the example for you to work through, kind of make sure that you can go through all these steps on your own. And then in the next video, we'll pick this up again. In the next video, we'll be taking a look at our specific kind of distributions, the binomial and the Poisson. So let's take a look at our example. Let's suppose that you were to roll you were to roll two dice, right? And these are your standard um, six-sided dice, right? Your D6. And so you're going to roll two dice. And what you want to do is you want to roll the dice, roll the dice, roll the dice. And you want to add up the numbers on each roll. So, right, if you were to roll the dice, uh, let's just say, right, there's a dice. That one's a one. Here's another dice. And this guy here is a three, well, okay, you roll those dice and you're like, yeah, okay, there we go, I have a four. You would roll it again, get another result, you add it up, right? One plus, and you're just gonna be summing your dice. What we're gonna be looking at here is we wanna create a discrete probability distribution of the results of this. So you're rolling two dice, boom, boom. What does this look like? Create the table of this discrete probability distribution and then create the bar chart of it. Some uh, follow up kind of questions on that is what value, uh, so how do you spell value? What value is most likely? Next one, what is the expected value? What is our expected value of x? That is, when we sum them, if you were to roll the dice and just sum it, which value would you expect the most? What's our average roll? And then based off of that, right, expected value of x, you could also write that as what is our mean of x, mu of x. Final one, what is our standard deviation of x? What does that guy work out to? So, okay, didn't write this, but first thing, Create a frequency table. Create a bar chart. From there, what is our most likely value or what value do we witness the most? You could think of that as our mode value. What is our expected value or mean? And what is our standard deviation? Finally, what we could do is we could work out, I could say, right, let's do this as our final kind of one. What is the probability of getting some value of x? So x being our summation of the two dice, right? This would be our random variable. Some value of x that is greater than or equal to 10. So again, right, if we wanted to think about that, this would be our addition rule. That is, we'd be looking at, hey, what is my probability that I get a value of x equals 10? Or x equals 11 or x equals 12. We'd have to think about that then, right? We'd have to say, okay, is this our special edition rule? Is this our general edition rule? That all depends back to whether or not these events are mutually exclusive or not. And then we can add those up and say, okay, what's the prob probability that I witness one or the other or the other? And we can calculate that as such. So, We'll leave that for you to work through. Again, what we're doing is we're rolling two dice, we're summing those two dice together, and we wanna create the frequency table and bar chart of all of those possible situations, and then go from there. Pause the video, see what you can work out. I'm not gonna work through this step by step. Go back to our last one, see if you can kind of get it. What we'll do is I'll jump to the next page, I'll put the answers up, and you can kind of compare your result to what my result is on the next page. So again, pause before you make that jump, see how you do, and then you can compare the results in the end.
Okay, so to take a look, we have our table here of our possible results, right? So rolling our dice, we would have possible sums of 2 through to 12, right? We can't have a possible sum of 1 because the lowest one we could roll on each dice is a 1, so 1 plus 1 is 2. And then going through for this. If you're trying to figure out, hey, how many outcomes do I have all together? Well, the result there is 36. How did we get that? Well, okay. We're rolling two dice, possible outcomes on each one. This is just our rules of arrangement. Six possible outcomes, six possible outcomes, 36 possible outcomes altogether. So that's how we got that guy there. And then we just, the way that I worked through this, I said, okay, on the first dice, I roll one, 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 one. Uh, one. Second dice, I roll one, two, three, four, five, six. And then added them up, right? So two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And then repeated that. Two, 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 two. One, two, three, four, five, six. Added them up. Did that for all of the ones, all of the twos, all the way through till all of the sixes. From there, I just kind of isolated down. Okay, hey, there's a two. Well, that occurred once. Here's a three. Well, okay, three occurred twice, and then on and on and on and on, creating my frequency table. Once I have my frequency table, jumping over to the relative frequencies. So relative frequency, the probability of X occurring in the classical sense. Hey, this occurred once out of 36. So one over 36 is 3%. I rounded everything to two decimal places just for simplicity. Right, Many of these did go on farther, but two decimal places was enough for us to get a good idea. XPX, right? same idea here. So this is for me working out the mean. So what's my X? 2 times my probability gave me my XPX. Summation of XPX is 7, giving me my mu, my average value of X. So average value of X is seven, my most likely roll. Working out the standard deviation sigma, well, I'm gonna take my squared deviations times the probability. So that would have been two minus seven squared times 0 0.03, give me 0.69. Summing all of that gives me 5.83. Well, 5.83, this guy here, that's my variance of X. So to get my standard deviation, right, just my sigma X, I take the square root of 5.83, leaving me with 2.42. Now, right, again, this, you might be going through this and you might get 5.83, and then you go and you take the square root of that and you get something like 2.414. And you're like, 2.41? Oh no, we have different numbers. How did you get the square root of 5.83 to equal 2.42? Well, okay, this all of this calculation was in Excel. I have this displayed to two decimal places, but when you use Excel or another stats kind of program, even though it displays two decimal places, it keeps all the decimal places in the calculation. So all of those all together is some other number, right? But rounding to 5.83, take the square root of that, gives me 2.42. Typical kind of thing, if we're going to report our answer to two decimal places, ideally, we should be keeping all of these results to at least four decimal places, right? And in that case there, we have a little bit of extra accuracy for when we do our final rounding. But for simplicity of display, I did everything to two. So we're good for that. We have our mean, we have our standard deviation. What was our mode, our most likely value? Well, most likely value right there, seven, same as our mean, so we have that. Final question we asked is, hey, what was the probability of witnessing a roll greater than or equal to 10? So a roll of 10, a roll of 11, or a roll of 12. This was our addition rule. And hey, because this would be a mutually exclusive situation, that is, if I were to roll two dice, I'm either going to witness a 10 or an 11 or a 12. I can't witness a 10 and a 12 on the same roll. 
right? So they're mutually exclusive. This will be my special edition rule where all I'm going to do is add them up. So 8% plus 6% plus 3% gives me 17%. Another way to think about this with our bar chart is I can say, okay, probability of witnessing 10 or more. Well, I'm just going to take the area kind of of underneath all of these different bars. So that was 8%, 6%, 3%, shaded it in to kind of demonstrate, hey, this is the area that I'm taking. And again, that is our 17%. So we work that out as such. So that's kind of last kind of question to look at with this. Don't get too caught up with this kind of style of working through discrete probability distributions. Our focus on this is going to be on the two we'll be taking a look at in the next video, our binomial and our um, binomial and our Poisson. This guy here, this was just more to give us the idea of the basics of a discrete probability distribution before we moved on kind of into more of a black box kind of equation style of approaching it. So that does this for the basic introduction. Next video, we'll get into two specific versions of our discrete probability distributions.